Hey, Pete, do you have a few minutes? Uh, yeah. What's up? I've been working on a few pitches for the TV network executives, and I want to run them by you to see what you think. The TV network executives? What are you talking about? Oh, you know, I'm just always bubbling over with awesome ideas for new shows, and I thought if I got a few of them down on paper, I might be able to sell one for a million bucks or so. Oh, is that what you think? Just get them on paper and bam, you make a million bucks? That would be a pretty sweet deal. Right? So do you want to hear them? Oh, trust me. I can't wait to hear them. Great. Here's the first one. I call this one, Are You Smarter Than America's Next Top Model? Okay. Well, what's it about? Well, it's kind of a twist on Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Contestants still have to answer trivia questions, but instead of pitting them against a group of brainy 11-year-olds, they're competing against a bunch of gorgeous runway models hoping to make their big break on the New York fashion scene. Why would fashion models want to be part of a trivia contest? Well, in America's Next Top Model, they just walk up and down the runway looking fancy. But this show would give them a chance to show off their brains, too. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm sold on it. Uh, what else you got? Okay. How about the Great British Housewives of New Jersey? Hmm. Let me guess. It's about a bunch of New Jersey housewives competing to see who can make the perfect tea and crumpets. No, Pete. That would be stupid. It's about a bunch of British bakers competing to see who can make the perfect cannoli. Yeah, well, either way, it sounds like it's going to irritate people on both sides of the Atlantic. Sorry, dude. I think this one's a no-go, too. Fine. But I know you'll love this next one. All right. Let's hear it. Fear Factor Family Feud. Huh? Huh? Well, it's very alliterative. I know. That's what I love about it. So how's it work? I'm not totally sure yet. I just put it together because Fear Factor and Family Feud have so many Fs. Mm, I see. Maybe we could have family teams that have to eat bugs or jump out of helicopters or something. Uh, Noah, can we stop for a sec? I can't help but notice that all of your pitches are just mashups of other game shows. Well, yeah, that's what I was going for. Okay, but why? Well, there's this new show I saw on TV the other night, Deal or No Deal Island. It's basically Deal or No Deal meets Survivor. And I thought, hey, if they can combine two hit game shows into one, then why can't I? Dude, you can't just pick any two shows and smash them together. I don't think it works like that. Fine. Then I'm not even going to tell you about who wants to be the masked newlywed shark. You know what? Not telling me about it is the best idea I've heard yet. Ha uh ha. -huh. But, you know, I used to love Deal or No Deal back in the day, and I'm pretty sure there's some interesting math going on in there. So, why don't you cancel your network pitch meeting, and we can spend some time talking about suitcases full of cash. Okay. Just give me a few minutes. I need to get my people to call their people and do what people do when they cancel a meeting. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Math Club. Hey there, Pete. How are you doing? Hello, Noah. I'm doing really well. Hello, Math Club. What's shaking? What have you been up to? Well, definitely my biggest news is that after nine years in my role as an instructional technology coach, I'm going to be heading back into the elementary school classroom next year. I'll be teaching a third grade class at one of the schools where I've been coaching. It's a great school, and I'm going to be joining a fantastic team of teachers there. And this is going to be my first time back in my own classroom in nine years. So I'm equal parts really excited and kind of nervous, but I'm definitely looking forward to it. Does this mean that Arnold Denominator is going to make an appearance sometime this coming year? Arnold Denominator is definitely going to be in the house. Perfect. <laughs> well, congratulations. Uh, I'm pretty excited for you. Like a new chapter, right? Another adventure. Yeah, and I am sure we'll talk more about it 
come the end of August when it actually becomes my daily reality. What is new with you? Yeah, well, the biggest news for me recently is I've been watching a lot of TV. <laughs> actually, I haven't been watching that much, but I did finish The Queen's Gambit. And so I started something new, which is Deal or No Deal Island. The perfect smash up of two old shows. Yeah, you know, it's got some nostalgia for me. I used to enjoy both of these shows. I guess, I guess Survivor is probably still going in its like 84th season. But yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's kind of fun. You know, I, I don't know that I'm on board for like a decade's worth of shows moving into the future here, but certainly for now, it's kind of fun. And I've enjoyed thinking about the mathematics of the deal or no deal part of the show. Which honestly is what led us to the idea to do an episode about it today. Yeah, exactly. So I think we should probably get started by not assuming that all of our listeners have seen the original Deal or No Deal show, and we should probably explain a little bit how it works. Yeah, and I think we should focus on the original version of the show. The new version is a little bit different. It's been tailored to fit in with the theme of Survivor plus Deal or No Deal. And I think just because of the classic vibe of the original and its well-defined and familiar rules, I, th I think that's probably the right place uh, for us to focus. So we're going to focus on the Great British and not so much the Housewives of New Jersey. I don't think we're actually going to focus on either of those. That's a different show entirely. <laughs> All right. So I thought it would be fun if instead of us just rattling off the rules of how Deal or No Deal works, if instead we role-played a little bit of an episode to give people an idea of what went on. So how about I take on the role of the host, which I believe was Howie Mandel, and you take on the role of a contestant, which could be anybody you want. Can it be me? <laughs> it could be you. And I'm assuming at the end of all of this, I will be going home with a briefcase full of cash. Is that right? You will be going home with a briefcase full of cash, but there's a possibility that that cash could total one penny. Okay. All right. So fingers crossed. I'm hoping for five bucks. Welcome to Deal or No Deal, Pete. As you can see on the stage in front of you, we have 26 briefcases numbered 1 to 26. Each of those briefcases contains a different dollar amount, ranging from one penny all the way up to $1 million. Also, if you direct your attention to the big board on the wall here, we can see those same $26 amounts. For now, they're all lit up, showing that all 26 amounts are still in play. But that will change as we progress through the game. So, Pete, to start our first round, I would like you to pick any one of those 26 briefcases to be your briefcase, the one whose dollar amount you might very well be going home with today. Okay, so when I was a kid, I was on a soccer team called the Stormtroopers. And uh, my jersey number was five, so I am going to select briefcase number five. All right, and at this point in the game, one of our lovely deal or no deal spokesmodels will take briefcase number five and bring it over to you. Put it right down next to you. You now have that briefcase, and for the next part of our round, I'm going to tell you that you now have to choose six more briefcases. This time, the ones that you choose, we are going to open and reveal their amounts, and they will be removed from play. So, which briefcase would you like to choose first, Pete? Let's start with 17. All right, and then we open up briefcase number 17, and we see that it has inside $25,000. So. Up on our big board, on the wall, the $25,000 amount is now removed because that amount is out of play. Right, and I know a little bit more too. My own briefcase, the one I selected at the beginning of the game, briefcase number five, it also does not contain the $25,000. That amount is totally out of play. That's correct. So, what would you like to choose for your second out of six in the first round? Well, since this is my second choice, let's go with briefcase number two. All right, we open up briefcase number two and reveal that that was $500. So now the $500 amount has been removed from play. Ooh, so this is good news because 
truth be told, I'm not that interested in 500 bucks. I mean, if somebody gave it to me, sure, but I would like my suitcase to have a very large number in it. And now I know it didn't have that lowly $500. So this is good. I like this. All right, now we're gonna fast forward a little bit because I think our listeners get how this part works. So now at this point, we've opened all six of your choices and all of these amounts have been removed from the game and removed from the big board that we're looking at. The 25,500 we already mentioned. And in addition, we've removed $1, $10, $75 and $750. Wow, Pete. With the exception of the 25,000, those are all pretty low amounts that you eliminated from the game, which is great for you. You know that your briefcase doesn't contain any of those. And at this point, there are now 20 briefcases remaining in play, one of them in your possession and the other 19 still up on the stage. Excuse me a second, Pete, I have to take this. Hello? Uh-huh. Yes. No, I don't think he realizes that. Oh no, I'm sure he doesn't realize that. Now, he might realize that, but not the other thing. All right. Okay, I'll tell him. Pete, that was the banker on the phone. If you glance over your shoulder, you can catch a smoky silhouette of the banker watching us through that window above the stage right now. He's called to make you an offer of a certain dollar amount in exchange for stopping the game right here and giving up whatever is in your briefcase. And that offer is $26,000. So now you have a choice to make. You can either say, deal, take the 26,000, stop playing right now and go home $26,000 richer. Or you could say no deal and we'll go on to a second round where you'll now have to eliminate five more briefcases at the end of which the banker will call again and make you a revised offer. You know, Noah, what I'm wondering now is whether $26,000 is a good offer. Is it a deal that I should accept or one that I should let ride? And as a mathematician, I'd like to know how to answer that question in general. In other words, given some distribution of available dollar amounts, how can I determine if the banker's offer is any good? Right, and clearly the amounts still in play are going to give you some helpful information. Of the six cases you opened, Five of them had pretty low dollar amounts. That led to an offer of $26,000. But I'll bet that instead, if you had revealed more of the higher amounts, the banker would have made you a lower offer because you'd be feeling less confident that you had a higher amount in your briefcase. Yeah, that's right. And you know, I think it might be worth taking a step back and talking a bit about the dollar amounts that are on the board at the start of the game before anything has been revealed. And I think there are some mathematical observations I'd like us to make. And then I think we can talk a bit about statistics and probability. Okay, let's do that. Let's start with the dollar amounts on the board. Yeah, so you already mentioned that the lowest amount is one penny and the largest amount is $1 million. There are 24 other dollar amounts in between. And I'd like us to divide them into two groups of 12. So the lower 12 and the higher 12. And there's an interesting pattern between those two groups. Oh yeah, you know what, you're right. I'm looking at a picture of the board right now. And when I arrange them that way, I see that the first amount in the lower 12 is $1. And the first amount in the higher 12 is $1,000. Then the next two are $5 and $5,000, $10 and $10,000. $25 and $25,000, all the way up to $750 and $750,000. So if you remove the one cent and the $1 million, which are the highest and lowest, the others in between are two sets of 12. The higher set each correspond to one of the lower set times a thousand. That's right. And that is actually a rather large jump right, from each value in the lower group, multiply by a thousand to get a corresponding dollar amount in the upper group. And that has implications for how I'm going to think about the probability and statistics involved in making my decision. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I would assume that a good starting point here would be to take the mean or the average of all the dollar amounts on the board 
figure out kind of what the average is and then see if the offer being made is higher or lower than the average of what's left. Yeah. And in fact, if I make that calculation up front, let's say with the original 26 briefcases in front of me, that turns out to be $131,477.54. All right. Which obviously is not an amount that's in any one of those briefcases. That's not an amount you can actually win, but it is the average of all of the possible amounts. Yeah. And this quantity is also called the expected value. So in a sense, as a player of this game, I could say to myself, maybe I can expect to come home with about $131,000. And from that point of view, $26,000 seems pretty low. Okay. So do you think the mean or the expected value is the most important statistic to pay attention to here? Or is there something better? Well, I can't help but notice that as I consider all of these dollar amounts from one penny up to a million dollars, only six of them are actually bigger than $131,000, right? So starting with 200,000, 300,000 on up, 400,000, 500,000, 750,000 and a million. So there are six briefcases that contain more than this average quantity of 131,000. But that means that there are 20 briefcases that contain less than this. Oh, I see what you're saying. So just because 131,000 is the average, that doesn't mean you're likely to get something in that ballpark. There's a lot more cases that are lower than higher. And I can't help but notice that a significant number of those lower ones are quite a bit lower. There are 13 cases that are worth less than $1,000. Yeah, and when I picked briefcase number five, that first choice out of 26, the probability that I have selected something that is less than that average value is almost 77%. It's 76.9%. So in all likelihood, my briefcase number five contains something less than 131,000. So it sounds maybe like taking the average might mislead the contestant into thinking they have a really good chance of having more money than they actually have in their case. Yes. And that's because there is a second statistic that we need to pay attention to when looking at this distribution of dollar amounts. And that statistic is called the median. Move over, Bacon. Now there's something meatier. Oh, I'm familiar with the median. That means that if we rank all of the choices from lowest to highest, it's the one that appears right in the middle of the list. If there's an odd number of items on the list and it's the average of the two numbers at the middle, if there's an even number of items on the list. Right. And here there are an even number, 26. So we have to find those two middlemost dollar amounts, and they happen to be $750 and $1,000. So the median, which is halfway in between, is $875. And I'm guessing you're going to say here that the median is probably a much better predictor of what you've got than the mean. Well, I think I want to pay attention to both of the quantities. I think both the mean and the median are relevant. And in fact, as the rounds of the game move forward, my plan is to recalculate those quantities at every step. So where we are in the gameplay right now is we've imagined I've opened up six cases. Now I can recalculate the median and the mean at this point in the game and wonder, all right, relative to that information, how does the $26,000 offer look? Do I think it's any good or not? Right. And in fact, at this point in the game, the mean and the median have both shifted up from their starting values. You removed mostly lower amounts, so both of those statistics got higher. The mean is now $169,604, which is a bit higher than its starting value of $131,000, while the median is now $7,500, which is a huge leap from the starting median of $875. So how do you feel about a $26,000 offer when the mean of your remaining cases is about 170,000 and the median is 7,500? 
Yeah, I feel like the mean is becoming further and further out of reach. $170,000 is wildly high compared to the 26,000 that the banker has offered me. Now, if we look at the median, however, I'm much closer. $7,500 and $26,000 are quite a bit closer. And I can't help but notice that actually of the 20 briefcases still in play, 11 of them are worth less than the banker's offer, and only nine of them are worth more. So actually, this kind of tells me that maybe the $26,000 is pretty good. The $170,000 mean seems totally out of reach, but I have a better chance of coming out ahead if I take the deal than if I decline. Yeah, and I think that the designers of the game intended it that way. I think they purposely picked values in this game that will skew that mean and make it seem much more likely that you've got a higher amount than you do. I bet they're banking on the fact that a lot of players will mistakenly assume that there's a 50-50 chance their briefcase contains more than the current mean of $170,000. But in reality, it's the median, not the mean, that determines that 50-50 cutoff point. Half the cases are above $7,500 not $170,000. Right. So 11 of the cases are worth less than $26,000. 11 out of 20 available is about 55%, which means that the nine that are worth more than the offer, that's about a 45% chance. So it's close to 50-50, slightly to my advantage then to take the deal. However, my gut is telling me Let's let it ride because $26,000 would be really sweet, but a million dollars would be a lot sweeter. Sweet. Totally. Okay, well, yeah, obviously I can't argue with that, but here's what I think is the quite literal million dollar question. When we said we were going to analyze the mathematics of deal or no deal, what I kind of thought we were eventually going to get at was some kind of a way to use math to predict what is the banker going to offer in any particular situation. So now that we've talked a little bit about the mean and the median, my question for you is, Pete, is there a way to predict the banker's offers before the banker makes them? I think that's a great question. And that is something that I myself wondered about literally every time I watched this show. So let's kind of tease out a little bit exactly what we mean by predicting the banker's offer. So give me a little more information about what you have in mind. Well, I guess what I meant was, does the banker give a specific offer based on the cases that are left in play? In other words, if two contestants chose the exact same six cases to eliminate in the first round, so everything that was left for each of them was the same, would they get the same offer from the banker? Is there an algorithm or some kind of a model that the banker's using based on the cases that have been opened and the cases that are left that just sort of tells the banker, put in these amounts and I will spit out the answer of how much you should offer? Oh, like a mathematical function. Like you input, okay, the first case revealed was $100,000. The second case revealed was $10 and so on. Like you enter these six quantities and then hit enter. And then it spits out a number like this is what the banker is going to offer you. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm wondering. Well, it's definitely an interesting question. And like I said a moment ago, it's one that I've often wondered about myself. But you might recall that when we were preparing for this episode, I mentioned that to come up with that kind of mathematical model, we'd need some actual data from the show. There's really no way to do it without real data. Yeah, I remember that. So to help us with this, I went online and looked around to see if I could find any data about the banker's offers in the show. And I did find a spreadsheet that contains 355 individual rounds of play. Now that doesn't mean 355 different contestants. A lot of these contestants went more than one round and we have data for every round that each of them played. What we do have though is 47 unique contestants. 
So we have at least a first round for all 47 of them. And then we have second round data, third round data, fourth round data for those that didn't take a deal in those early rounds. Right. And after you sent me the spreadsheet, I spent some time running the numbers, as they say, and I did come up with a couple of ideas. Did you get to something that can accurately predict the banker's offers before he makes them? Well, we'll get to that. But first, I have a kind of fun idea. Before I tell you what I did, what if we challenge our listeners to see what they can come up with and then compare the results? Ooh, I love that idea. Let's share the spreadsheet with our listeners and give them a few weeks to play around with it and see what kind of predictive algorithms they can come up with. Yeah, and we'll give a shout out to any listeners who take a stab at this challenge and share their results with us. Okay, Math Club, the ball's in your court for now. If you'd like to check out the data that Pete used, you can find it at bit.ly slash mathclubpodcast45 because this is our 45th episode. So that's bit.ly slash mathclubpodcast45. We'd love to hear about any models that you come up with. Pete, how about you tell folks how they can reach out to us if they come up with something they'd like to share? Sure. Math Club, we'd love to hear your answer to this challenge. If you have thoughts or just want to contact us for any other reason, you can leave us a voice message on our SpeakPipe page. That's speakpipe.com slash mathclubpodcast. Or you can find us on Twitter. Our handle is at mathclubpodcast. And of course, you can always send us a good old fashioned email. Our address is mathclubpodcast at gmail.com. Man, I can't wait to hear what you and our listeners come up with for this. Me too. I'm definitely looking forward to it. All right, Math Club, get to work and we'll see you next time. Bye.